virtual tour of the Sistine Chapel, the secrets of the Sistine Chapel. My name is Mario Bernardi of the Grand Tour Europe. So for the time being, the microphones have been muted and we are also broadcasting live on our YouTube channel, the Grand Tour Europe, and our Facebook private group called Virtual Experiences. Um, we are going to visit virtually the Sistine Chapel using this app, which is available on the website of the Vatican Museums, and we'll actually be able to navigate as if we were actually inside of the chapel just to ourselves without the hundreds of tourists and visitors that usually used to um, visit the chapel every year. Currently, the Vatican Museums are closed. They will be closed till the end of January, hopefully opening up again February, March, by the spring, we hope. So for the time being, I hope you will enjoy the um, virtual tour. I can see that someone can't hear me. Um, this is everybody's problem or someone can hear me. If you can't hear, uh, try to log out and log in again. And um, so because I'll be doing the guiding now, if you need assistance, please message support. In the list of the participants, you find support, please message Giovanni, will be able to help you. If you can't hear through Zoom, the thing to do is to um, basically um, to um, uh, log out and give permission to Zoom to use the audio of your device or probably try to follow the audio. Okay, now I can hear. Okay, ciao everybody from France, from Houston, from all over the world. Keep posting and also keep posting on Facebook and YouTube. As I'm saying, uh, tonight we're going to explore the secrets of the Sistine Chapel. Some things that people might know, but a lot of things I'm going to uh, say to you tonight that probably you've never heard. First of all, let's go back to my um, presentation. Let me introduce uh, our company, the Grand Tour Europe, we are a small boutique tour operator organizing mostly tours of Rome, Italy, and some uh, European um, cities and destinations. Of course, we have not been able to do any tour in the last year. And so in the spring uh, 2020, we started uh, using the, um, we started um, uh, doing um, virtual tours, which have been quite successful, as you could see. Um, my name is Mario Bernardi. I'm an official tour guide, and I'm also the director of the Grand Tour. This is actually myself in Venice. Just before, this was 2019, the last summer we could properly travel. And tonight, as I said, we are talking about the Sistine Chapel. Just a couple of more things. I see someone keep messaging me about can hear or not hear. Um, please message support and he'll be able to help. If you cannot hear, we cannot help you because uh, it's your device. So you have to log out, log in again, and do help the thing. So if Johnny, if you can you message it, because of course they cannot hear me if I keep saying that. What shall I do? Just uh, Johnny, there's people on the chat here that can't hear. Um, okay, let me make sure. I just write on the chat, please contact support. Oh, thank you, Maya. Okay, so um, our story tonight starts some 40 years ago, you see this gentleman here, his name is um, uh, Gianluigi Colalucci, and he is um, the author of this book, I don't know if you could see it through the camera, called Io e Michelangelo. Um, basically, he's, in this book, he has written all the story of the restoration of the Sistine Chapel, starting in 1980. Back then, he was in charge, he was the, uh, the man in charge of the restoration of the Sistine Chapel and the maintenance. So was the head of the small team that takes care of all the um, antiquities within the Vatican Museums and the Sistine Chapel. So they do restorations, they do the cleaning and all that. And back then, it was 1980, he was restoring this part up here. You see the 14, um, 
these frescoes were made in 1480s before Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And they represent different popes. And then there are the real windows and the painted windows here in the back. It was just restoring the bit because there were some damages. And down below there are some um, 16 um, uh, century paintings that were some frescoes that we're going to uh, talk about later on. And while it was uh, painting that part, he saw that the walls had a thick level, a layer of sooth, dirt, uh, oils and fats that had been used to clean and restore the surface during the 16th, 17th, 18th century. For hundreds of years, every time they're trying to fix things by making the surface smoother or repair it, they actually sometimes made it worse. And he had got this idea to just take a little um, napkin and with a bit of, little bit of saliva start scraping the wall and clean a little bit of Michelangelo's fresco. This figure up here, the figure of El Azar, and um, which was painted by Michelangelo between 1508 and 1512. Uh, and um, with, this, with this surprise, what he, he found beneath that, this is a part where he was cleaning much later the the ceiling in the center, but you could see the difference with the dirt dark part, which was as the Sistine Chapel looked before it was restored and the clean part. Because he then asked the permission to uh, the director to clean all of this figure to the right, El Azar. And with this great surprise, when he finished the job, he saw this beautiful young man with this beautiful white shirt bright. And it was something completely different to what they were used uh, to. Because traditionally, the Sistine Chapel was considered a dark masterpiece, uh, uh, um, somewhere where Michelangelo expressed the despair of salvation with these dark tones and these heavy figures. And if you look at the ceiling, these are pictures taken before the restoration. This is how the Sistine Chapel looked like until the 1980s. So it was dark, it was com it had completely different colors. So if you, if you see how it is now, you can see that the colors are bright. It's like there are these pinks, these reds, these blues, everything is quite strong and, and, and bright. While in this one, you see all the colors are pretty much dead and flat. And this changed forever the way we've been looking at Michelangelo ever since. Now, this is another picture that shows the process of the restoration, if you could see it, where you could see that they were analyzing the wall, making sure that there were no damages, separating the part that was repainted later by the original parts, fill in the crops. I mean, the whole process took some uh, 12 years. Actually, 12 years was the time that they planned to be working on. It eventually took 14 years. They finished only in 1994. And there were many artists who protested, many uh, Italian and also American artists who wrote letters to the Pope at uh, that time was Saint John Paul II, well, wasn't Saint back, but it was His Holiness John Paul II, the Polish Pope, everybody remembers him, a very charismatic figure of the, of the 20th century. And he insisted, go ahead, go forward and clean it all, bring back Michelangelo to the, its original line. Uh, Colalucci is still alive, still living, although he's in his um, late 80s, I think now. <clears throat> And not long ago, he was interviewed by the national television in Italy. And he said that when he saw this beautiful figure emerging from the darkness of the centuries, he was about to cry. He said, I would have been on my knees to that figure because it was glorious. And that the thing that you, he was seeing, the real Michelangelo, it was one of the greatest emotions of his life. Uh, 14 years later, they completed the cleaning of the ceiling. And later on, also the walls were done, which was finished by the late 1990s. So uh, if you've been in the Vatican in 1980s, 1990s, you might have seen part of it blocked or the scaffolding especially the walls during 1990s. As we proceed, I want to show you the changes that they were because the figures like Jonas or <coughs> in this case uh, is Daniel, the prophet Daniel. You could see on the left it's before and on the right it's, um, it's after. Uh, let me just stop the sharing. Let me just share it again. Okay. Can you see this now? So this is Gianluigi Colalucci. And uh, this is how the Sistine Chapel looked before. I thought there was, yes. 
yes, this is the pre ninety eight image. Sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't see it. I don't, I don't read the chat. Sorry, um, you know, it's supporting is to. I don't read the chat during the. It's very distractive. So these are the the images how the Sistine Chapel looked before nineteen eighteen, really dark. And this is the moment where uh, the restorers were cleaning the ceiling. This is the the, um, the, the moment of the temptation of of um of um adam and eve and they ascend away of the garden of eden and then that's a prophet daniel as i was saying you could see that before and after so one of the key issues with the michelangelo's restoration with the fresco was that michelangelo painted of course the ceiling with the fresco technique so on the wet plaster but the shading, the final uh, shading of some of the figures, or some of the details, were made with a technique known as Nero Fumo, basically a bit of a smoke of a candle, which was able to give little delicate layers that were very hard to achieve with the fresco technique. So after the fresco was done, on top of that, it was doing this kind of um, gray, gray scaling with the smoke. Of course, if you are going to restore and clean a surface, the smoke is not possible to be restored, it just comes away. So if you look at like the details of the knee here, some part here on the left, some of the frame decoration, they are basically faded and lost with the restoration, they've been washed away. But other parts such as like the head of the putto here, well, they've been preserved a little bit better. And you could see the different, this is the, like one of the names of one of the prophets, Jonas. You could see the different before, before and after. There's a, a complete uh, total um, different tone. And again here, the, the knee. So some of the details like the scroll in the back and <clears throat> some other objects, they bring brought back to life because there isn't that dark patina anymore. But then on the other side, of course, the shading on the knee, some, some elements of death, they have been lost. And this has been criticized by a lot of art historians and, and artists as well, including, for example, Andy Worrell, which was actually a Catholic, which you would, wouldn't think it was that into, um, into uh, sort of classical art. But in fact, he was one of those who signed a petition to ask the Pope to stop the restoration, but they went ahead. And before we see the story of the Sistine Chapel, how Michelangelo came to the ceiling and what was there before Michelangelo, let's see what is the Sistine Chapel and what was it built. I have, um, I can, let me just, okay. So this is the Sistine Chapel from outside. I wanna show you through um, Google um, Maps. We can actually, um, we can actually see, the satellite and so this is the city of Rome if we zoom the Vatican City is right there by the river Tiber and um, of course the Vatican City State is an independent country now but back then in the 1400s and the 1500s it was just another palace in what was the kingdom of the church the Pope basically owned the entire part of central Italy. And right next to the Basilica of, of St. Peter, which at that time wasn't built in this shape yet, there was a different basilica, which was much smaller than the one that is there now, it was quite almost like the half this, just parallel to it, there is, of course, the Sistine Chapel. If, if we look at it from the outside, it kind of looked like a fortress. You could see it's very tall, pretty narrow, and then it's got this kind of mil military-like, um, let me see, this kind of military-like walkway, as you could see around it, as if it was a little castle. And this is because the architects who built it in the 1470s and 1480s were indeed military architects. Uh, Giovannino de Dolci was basically a, um, a, a, a military architect. And you could see um, you could see the um, the structure is quite high and it has this supports walls which were built in the 1500 actually to prevent the building from opening and unfolding because it's such a tall building. And then it's connected with the Vatican palaces, which is where back then the Pope lived. This building here 
where the Borgia apartments on the first floor and then on the other floor, the so-called rooms of Raphael, where the Pope lived in the 1500s. The Pope Julius apartments are there. And then the Palazzo Apostolico built a few decades later, where now it's the Popal apartment, although the current Pope doesn't live there because he doesn't like the idea of having a huge penthouse. So he just lives in the in the in the guest in the guest house. Um, if we um, go back to the presentation, this fresco, which is kept now inside the Vatican Museum in the, in the Pinacoteca, it's basically the um, ceremony with which the Pope Sixtus IV declared in charge of uh, uh, creating the Vatican Library uh, a man called Bartolomeo Platina, who is on his knees there, just standing in front of the Pope. Why we're looking at this? Well, Pope Sixtus was the Pope who wanted to rebuild the old chapel in the Vatican called Cappella Magna. There was already a chapel there before the Sistine Chapel was built, used by the Popes. And he wanted to build a bigger one, a better one. And he named the the chapel after himself. The chapel was actually dedicated to the Assumption of Virgin Mary, which is you know, every church or chapel is dedicated to a specific saint or an occasion. In this case, the Sistine Chapel is dedicated to the, <clears throat> the uh, Assumption of Mary. And Pope Sixus is the one sitting on the right, and then he's surrounded by his nephews, um, standing in the center with the red, um, with the uh, red cape is uh, the Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere, which was his nephew. And then he's the one who would became then later Pope Julius II, the one who actually asked Michelangelo to paint the ceiling. Anyway, Pope Sixtus, the fresco is by Melozzo da Forlì, an important artist of the 1400s. Um, sorry about that. I have to drink from the bottle because I'm at the computer. And if you have an open glass, if you knock it down, that would be the end of the tour. That's why I'm drinking. I'm not a savage. I just drink from the bottle because it's safer than drinking from a glass. Um, as I was saying, Pope Sixtus was also very interested in politics and he was a backing uh, an, an attempt to murder I know it doesn't sound very papal, but it's the Renaissance, though they did that kind of thing back then. Um, the, um, the assassination of the Medici, Giuliano, the Medici, who actually was killed in the, in the assassination, and Lorenzo il Magnifico, that we can see here in this beautiful bust, which is kept in the um, National Gallery in uh, in Washington DC. Um, the the so it's actually in America. In 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 this in the spring of 1478, the Pazzi were a family rival of the Medici. With the support of the Pope, they had tried to kill uh, Lorenzo Magnifico and his brother into the Florence Cathedral. That started a war because, of course, Lorenzo survived, but then he executed all everybody who took place, but he knew that the Pope was on that side. So they started a warfare between the kingdom of the church, the kingdom of Naples and, and uh, Florence. Eventually in 1480, the Turks attacked Italy. And so the Italians unified against the Turks. So that was the uh, uh, episode. This is the, assass the attempt to assassinate the, the Medici, the Pazzi conspiracy in a 19th century uh, painting. And um, basically the Pope, um, was able then to make a peace deal, a peace treaty with the Medici as a result of the crusade against the Turks. So as the Pope had just finished building the Sistine Chapel, he needed some artists to decorate and to paint it. And so he was able to have the greatest artist from Florence to come to Rome and to work for him. Now, if we go back inside the Sistine Chapel, you will see that the chapel is basically uh, a long and narrow building, very tall, and it has three different levels on the sides. The level in the center has episodes on the right of the life of Jesus Christ and on the left of the life of Moses. Then at that time, the ceiling had no uh, images, it had just the blue sky, as I'll, I'll show you later. And... Um, the uh, these frescoes were actually made by the painters sent from Florence um, by Lorenzo Magnifico as a symbol of goodwill, as a 
to, to celebrate the peace between them. In truth, the Pope really insisted because the aim of the church at that time was to overcome Florence in beauty and splendor. So they wanted the best artists to work, not for the Medici, which were bankers, but for the church. And before we see them in, a, in a more detail, um, because amongst them there were Botticelli, Perugino, Ghirlandaio, some of the greatest artists of that time, the generation before Michelangelo and Raphael. The structure, as I said, was built um, basically uh, by military architects. And in fact, that is the, the, the kind of a military look. Originally, the roof was a little lower, but there were damages in the roof. The roof leaked and there, and there were some structural problems. So eventually the roof was rebuilt. As you can see, the vault is halfway, it's not on the very top. So the vault is not in contact with the roof. There is a kind of a gap. And um, the so you don't see basically the actual um, roof system and the beam supporting it. There is a, a vault has been built like a, just to protect it. And um, in, in between, in the 1500s, they actually created the barracks of the Swiss guards. So they had the Swiss guards living in the basically in the loft above the Michelangelo sitting above the Sistine Chapel. And down beneath also there are rooms. Now, for those of you who have visited the Vatican Museums, if we if you have done the full tour, where you go to the rooms of Raphael, you go to the um, collection of contemporary art and the Borgia apartments, which is all those kind of rooms, one inside the other with 20th century art. That is, part of it is underneath the Sistine Chapel. So you actually walk underneath it. When you go, there's at some point, a couple of rooms that have artworks by Henri Matisse. And, um, and basically you will find that that big room is right underneath the Sistine Chapel and then you go and there's another 150 rooms and then you go all the way around and back into the into the the chapel and the chapel it's about 20 meters tall which is about uh, um, um, 60 feet tall and then it's about 14 meters wide which would be about 40 uh, feet wide and it's um, 40 meters long about 120 feet long so it's Pretty a good size uh, for a chapel is definitely very big. Of course, is not very big compared to an average church in Rome. What's the difference between a chapel and a church? So the church is usually on the street and serves a community of a neighborhood, and it's open to the, the to um, external visitors. The chapel it's a church that is within another building and usually only serves those who live or work in that building. So that's the main difference between a church and a chapel. Of course, the basilica is. It's a church of higher importance. I, I, I always tend to, uh, you know, clarify this because uh, it doesn't. It's not always clear. The the Pupil apartments they have many chapels. It's not just this one. So the Sistine Chapel is the large, but there's several other chapels inside the the. The, the Vatican City and the Vatican palaces. Of course, you can never have enough chapels. And uh, this is a, a drawing showing how the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel looked like before Michelangelo worked there. As I said, this so this was uh, about uh, 1483, 1484, when the Florentine artists completed the episodes of the life of Christ, of Moses and the, and the popes. And you can see on the ceiling, there are these concentric, concentric stars. We don't really know how the ceiling was. We have a couple of drawings that are hypothetical reconstruction. It was a starry sky, which is very beautiful. Probably the stars were in a position that would have uh, depicted some constellation, maybe related with the birth of the Pope of some other occasion, but there's no studies about that carried out yet. So that would be something interesting to find out if the starry stars, the starry ceiling in the in the chapel depict the specific um, a specific moment in the in the in the sky, or if it was just like a decorative one. I prepared for the first one, and then this is again Lorenzo Lorenzo Magnificent on the left and Pope Sixtus on the right. So he sent a large group of artists because each one of the masters, uh, Sandro Botticelli was in charge to coordinating them all. But then there was Ghirlandaio in his workshop, Cosimo Rosselli, Bartolome della Gatta, a few others. So there were really a lot of painters uh, uh, there. The episodes, let me just swap to the, to the, to the 3D uh, modeling now. Basically, they start close to the altar, um, which had as well more 
uh, there were three more images. There was uh, Moses rescues from the water here on the left, and there was the adoration of the shepherds on the right um, with the Magi kings as well. So it was basically the birth of Christ on the right and Moses rescued from the water. In the center, there was a, another image uh, with the Assumption of Mary. So on the right, we have uh, Pietro Perugino, with the christening of Christ, which is the one I had in the first picture. And on the opposite one, we have Moses, uh, a first episode of his life with his Moses journey to Egypt with the circumcision of his son. As you can see, the first rites with which uh, respectively a Christian start his path in his faith and a Jew start his path as a Jew are basically parallel. And most episodes, they have kind of parallelism between Christianism and Judaism to prove that Christianism was like inheriting and, and continuing what was promised in the Old Testament, kind of accordance between the two faiths. And this is not an invention for the Sistine Chapel, it was something that was done before in other churches. So let's say it was pretty canonical. One thing that people usually say about the frescoes, which is true for most frescoes made in the Middle Ages, is that these images, they were illustrating the Bible and the, um, and the uh, New Testament, the gospel, in a way that people could easily understand what was going on. And was also a way to teach the poor and the illiterate that most people back then didn't have an education, couldn't even read. Um, but this is true for most churches, but not in this case. Sistine Chapel wasn't for the general public. This was the chapel of the popes. There were here uh, cardinals, there was the Popal, Popal Curia, the Popal Court, there were theologists, there were philosophers, there were important people here. So these frescoes, they have a number of hidden significance and meanings, which are a lot stronger and a lot deeper than the average fresco will go. If we have a look in more details, I use the picture because they're better than the 3D model. You could see in the background, there is the city of Rome. You can recognize the Colosseum, the uh, Triumphal Arch, like could be one of the many arches in Rome. Constantine Arch was usually canonically the arch that was taken as a model. And then we have you have a, a church with the uh, another building there. You have the bell tower and another building, which is basically the Pantheon with the beautiful dome. So you have a precise um, background, and you also have a lot of figures. Many of them are contemporaries that could be recognized back then. We are going to illustrate some more later on. And you can see the details in the background. They're always very fine and very often uh, detailed with gold, because of course, was the chapel of the Pope. So it was basically a very wealthy and rich place. The next one down were made by uh, um, Sandro Botticelli, which was uh, basically one of the greatest, not the greatest Florentine painter at that time. These frescoes were made more or less at the same time when he made the, for example, the birth of Venus and the um, and the um, and the spring, which were which are in the Uffizi Gallery. They were made more or less in the same years in the fourteen in the fourteen eighties. Uh, although those paintings were made for Lorenzo Magnifico's cousin, and there are the Temptation of Christ with Christ tempted by the devil, with another building in the background which was the Collegium Saxorum, it was basically the hostel for the, the uh, British pilgrims, the Saxon pilgrims in the 8th, 9th century, 10th century. That building was rebuilt in the 1400s and is still there uh, in the same shape. If you look, uh, if you walk from the St. Peter's Basilica to the river, it's just along there and you can actually see today looking pretty much the same. And on the opposite one, there are episodes of the life of Moses with Moses and the daughters of Jethro in the center, which you can see it's um, it's uh, the daughters of Jethro look very much alike the um, the women in both uh, Venus in the birth of Venus or the, the graces in the spring. And they're very much like the muse that inspired many of the portraits made by uh, Botticelli, um, Simonetta Vespucci, which was a beautiful woman. She was in her 20s and was portrayed many times in the late 1400s. She only died young. She died in the 20s, so it became one of kind of uh, images of beauty in the in the Florence of the end of 15th century. And then you have Moses def the defending the 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 um, a Jewish boy being attacked by an Egyptian, so he realizes that the Egyptians were slaves, and basically here he's taking his shoes off and and uh, and having the vision of the uh, burning bush here with God appearing within like a burning bush. Although Botticelli makes sure that 
God is represented canonically as an old man with a long flowing beard. And then he's taking out the Jews from slavery walking. And you can see there's a little doggy here held by a man, by a boy. This dog is not just just the dog that appeared to be there just by chance. It was the dog or one of the colleagues of Botticelli, um, Cosimo Rosselli, who worked just in the next uh, frescoes. He had a, as well a workshop, so it means many pupils with him. And he had also a little doggy looking like that, which ran up and down the scaffolding and probably was greeted by all the artists. It became the old, uh, you know, everybody who worked there basically adopted this dog as a pet. So this dog appears five more times in the Sistine Chapel in different frescoes. In, in, and it's always the same dog. And it's kind of like a little signature. The artists had so much space to fill. So it, they added, they love to adding all these little elements of details that made it the uh, the actual fresco the biblical story actually coming to life and becoming more more real also there are some special effects the tree in the center it's an oak tree and the reason for it to be <coughs> an oak tree sorry is that the coat of arms of the family um della rovere it's the oak tree right above the main door here. There is a big coat of arms with the cross keys and the tiara and the oak tree there, which is basically the symbol of the della Rovere family. Oak tree means, uh, ro Rovere means oak tree in Italian. So it's here. And uh, Botticelli made some little wax acorns which were gilded. So they would have been glittering and as well as the little gilded leaves. So to create some special effects. So imagine when it was first made it must have been very bright with a lot of lights going on and these beautiful gilded acorns and then here again the doggy in another portion of the fresco in a different fresco so this same dog was basically represented several several times i've been asked many times what breed what breed of dog it is um um it looks chihuahua which didn't have chihuahua back now i'm not sure about the breed of the dog though and um, next door uh, opposite to the um, to the one just seen, there is the calling of the disciples Peter and Andrew, which was painted by a different painter again. So as you can see, this was a big, um, usually you have one chapel made by one artist, but in this case, because it was so big, of course, many, many workshops were sent. And so this was made by Ghirlandaio and his workshop. Ghirlandaio uh, later on uh, is the one who made the uh, chapel Cappella Tornabuoni in uh, in uh, in uh, Santa Maria Novella or the Sassetti Chapel, which are considered Sassetti Chapel is considered his masterpiece as well in uh, in Florence. And um, and the, you could see that there's slightly differences in the style. But Botticelli is quite recognizable because he had this kind of uh, um, uh, elements of vibrant element and, and element of aesthetic beauty in it. Um, the figures of um, of Gilandario that are more sculptural and also the colors are much brighter and there's a, 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 a full display of people. You can see that he basically makes sure he fill everything apart from the space with Jesus Christ and the uh, brothers Peter and Andrew being called to become the, the, the disciples. He, they were fishing and Christ called them and said I'll make you a fisher of, of souls. And um, and uh, there's also the hidden signature of the artist. If you look, there's a, this boy here in the back on the left, which has a garland in his head. It's right at the back on the left of the fresco. And you can see that garland in Italiano is Ghirlanda, hence Ghirlandaio, his son name. So this kind of objects hidden in the frescoes or less visible, let's say, they are uh, called cryptomania. They're basically hidden signatures that artists used to put in there just to say, I made this. Sometimes they put their name in some of the framing or something. Some other times they put some letters. Some other times an object that refer to their names. And we'll see some more. The, on the opposite wall, there is the uh, fresco first of the uh, Jews crossing the Red Sea, which of course is red. And then we have by Bartolomeo della Gatta, and then we have Cosimo Rosselli painting the Moses um, taking down the Ten Commandments and getting angry at the Jews because of the um, gilded calf. And you could see here that down 
on the frame right here, let me just go back there, right here by the dog, there's a little doggy here again, same dog again, then there's a little white cup with some red paint right on the edge of the frame, which is this one here. And the frame looks like it's coming out, actually coming out, so it's, that's quite interesting. And um, and you can see that the red paint and a brush. So this is the signature um, of the uh, painter Cosimo Rosselli, Rosso, means red so that's the Rosselli signature in there and then the, we have the speech of the mountain and the healing of the labor of course in all the episodes of Christ and this one we saw it's the Botticelli with the <clears throat> with the temptation of Christ Christ tempted of the devil by the devil is on the top of the church then on the top on the left in the bush and then eventually there's a table set up for the service top right and then he he, he, he finds the, the devil and pushing which is pushed off of the edge and you could see it's kind of a master uh, disguise as a as a as a monk um in, in while in the center is kind of a pagan sacrifice but it's kind of a prefiguration of what was about to come and then the last one of the, the last but one on the on the right wall is the last supper um of course and um which we have actually so if we go back on the model we have to pass through this wall. This passage was basically to separate the part for the clergy for the part for the public. Of, of course, being the chapel of the Pope, there is a larger part dedicated to the clergy here and the Pope has also his own corner. So on this side, there are, the last one is the Last Supper here. And then there is the Handling of the Keys by Pietro Perugino, which is considered one of my, Perugino's masterpieces. I have a, a better, a better, um, a better, description there um just before we move on in the last supper you can see there are also three more frescoes within the fresco and also in the ceiling again there is the uh, coat of arms of the pope as well as judas is the only one sitting opposite to everybody else like here you can see here it's just the only one sitting on our side while everybody is just nicely displayed there yeah, because of course you have to stand out and then there's a little creature a devil speaking in the back of his head that's just pushing him to evil and then you can see the capture of jesus on the left like a kind of a painting within the painting and then you can see here the coat of arms of the popes again in the roof in a kind of a kind of a steep perspective if you look up here you can see it up here while next door there is the beautiful handling of the keys which is considered one of perugino's masterpieces um And you could see here the handling of the keys, which is very, um, it's central, it's pivotal in the, um, in the uh, history of the church. As Jesus Christ handed the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter, making him the very first pope. So the pope today are not just the bishop of Rome, but they descend from that kind of line that has the keys to the to, to the kingdom of heavens for a roman catholic there's no salvation outside of the roman church outside of the church so that is the key, the reason why everywhere in the vatican city you will always see the cross keys put above every coat of arms of the pope because that's the very reason for the pope for being the pope basically because he's the one who have received the keys that has been passed on from peter to, to peter and from peter on to the next pope till the end of times the fresco is one of the most beautiful of all of the renaissance and is quintessentially renaissance uh, uh, art because there is a beautiful space well divided by perspective so geometry defines the space the beautiful octagonal um, temple in the center which is reminds of the baptistry of uh, San Giovanni, of course, the baptistry of Florence, uh, with the, on the side two triumphal arches. So again, Renaissance was the rebirth of art and, and culture from the Roman times and the Greek times, rebirth in the in the 50, 14 and 1500s again. And that is kind of a manifesto of it because you have classical art, classical buildings together with the Christian heritage. And that was exactly what they did in the Renaissance. And you can visually see it. Also, Perugino signed in the um, blue um, 
vest of Christ here around his, his, his body, there are some gold letters where the P appears, not the full name, but just the P. So again, the signature. And some people recognize it in some of the people here, the, um, the portrait of uh, possibly Perugino or, for example, this two, so Perugino would be this one here, and the, this two here, which would be uh, Giovannino de Dolce and Baccio Pontelli, which were the one who actually designed and built the chapel. So the, the architects were just finished building the chapel, so they're representing there. And you can see they have the compass and the square. And they, this is a real portrait. These are portraits of how they actually look like. Uh, um, and on the opposite wall, there is this other glorious fresco, which is very important for the history of the church, because in this one, the Pope wanted to represent the punishment of the Jews who tried to rebel against Moses. So those who tried to rebel against the church, the spiritual authority. And the reason for that is that there were already, uh, during the 1400s, lots of um, heretics, there were a lot of the theological discussions, and not long after, then Lutheranism, a Protestant started. So uh, Martin Luther came at the beginning of 1500 to Rome, and after that he started the the the, pro, the, the Protestant theism. So the Pope wanted to give a very clear message, and that message was that if you question the authority of the church, basically you go to hell. That's literally there on the left. You could see um, on the right you have. The, a temple stoning Moses by Dat and Abinon and Korah, which trying to uh, basically rebel against him because they were, this, they said, you've been dragging us in the desert for decades and there's no sign of a promised land and only Jews only reached the promised land after um, Moses passing. So 40 years later, so they were kind of losing a bit of faith. But the message was, if you keep your faith, you'll be rewarded. And so it was, and this is all the main meaning about the book of Exodus, that you have to keep the faith and then finally you get to your goal. So you should never give up. And uh, which besides the fact you, you're a believer or not, is anyway, a, a, I think a good way of thinking, especially in difficult times like this one. Anyway, on the left, then in the center, there's Moses with his stick just, invoking a punishment and then the, the the earth opens and they fall down into the into the earth but next to Moses there is another man dressed up as the Pope that's Aaron his brother which was the the priest of the temple and in background this beautiful marble uh, marble arch you can see on the right here the two portraits of the two brothers which actually look exactly the same and they look very very much like the Pope himself. So in this fresco, the Pope wanted to have his own image as Aaron, as Moses, because he is the spiritual authority. And in the, on the top here, the description says in Latin, Nemo sibi, as, sibi assumat honorem nisi vocatus adeo tamquan aron, which is Latin. It means no one should claim such a honor of being uh, the high priest. If if not um, uh, by a call, if not called by God as Aaron was, so the idea was you can only be a leader of the church if you were receiving a call directly from God. And the idea of the keys from Christ it was exactly there the proof that the church had to say the Pope is the guy and is the leader. I hope I'm not getting to church, but this is fundamental to understand fully the meaning of what we're seeing. And then back here in the background on the left of the marble arch, which is down here on the left, sorry for flicking back and forth. Here on the left, you can see this, this, this ship. There's the one that has the Florentine flag, which symbolizes basically the Florence artists coming to to Rome. So the Renaissance arriving finally in Rome and Rome actually during 1500 was the center of, it, of, of art and became one of the main centers of the Renaissance where some of the greatest artists work as Michelangelo as we will shortly see. The next one uh, made by several artists including Luca Signorelli, a very talented artist which was very young back then, um, has the last episodes of the life of Moses and eventually the death of Moses. On the on the end wall, there were two more frescoes made by Ghirlandaio, but the actual door, the, the, the door cracked and part of the, of, the, of the architrave supporting the dome basically uh, cracked. There was a, a huge crack and, the, and the, the, some of the frescoes basically fell down. They nearly killed the Pope. This was at the beginning of the 1400s. 
and so so basically they had to they had to redo them they did that in the 1560s 1570s and they were made by Jan van der Breck and Matteo da Lecce these were made in late 1500 so this is much later everything else this is the last part that was added and they're not the same it's mannerist art so late renaissance art late 1500 arts it's a it's a, they were trying to do something like Miguel in Michelangelo style and there's the angels and demons fighting for the body of Moses the angels won eventually and on the left the resurrection of Christ so from the very beginning of the life of the two to the very end now how did Michelangelo got involved with the chapel so Michelangelo was basically trained as a sculptor although he had worked in the um, workshop of Ghirlandaio when Ghirlandaio came back to Florence after the Sistine Chapel he made the uh, Cappella Tornabuoni for the Tornabuoni family the Tornabuoni were uh, working in the in the Medici bank but they were also um, in, in Lucrezia Tornabuoni which was uh, which was the sister of Francesco Tornabuoni, the head of the family in the 1400s, 1480s, uh, married um, um, the father of Lorenzo il Magnifico. So basically she was Lorenzo's uh, mother. Let's go on. Uh, and she is a key to the success of uh, her son because it was a highly educated woman. And also she arranged a wedding with the Orsini family. For Lorenzo, so making the Medici marry one of the oldest Italian families, also uh, with ties with the church. And some um, um, 30 years after the uh, frescoes were, about 25 years after the frescoes were made in the chapel, Pope Julius, that we see here in this beautiful painting made by Raphael around 1515, uh, around 1510 probably um in the uh, this was actually painted in the, uh, the the painting was made in the rooms of Raphael that where the Pope apartments there where the Pope posed for the painter and in the same years where Michelangelo was working there the painting is now in the National Gallery in London and um you can see the acorns and the cross keys as part of a, you know, the acorns on the chair and the cross keys on the green walls of the room. Um, the Pope wanted to rebuild the Basilica of St. Peter. So he was the one who basically hired uh, Donato Bramante, the architect who started to destroy the old Basilica of St. Peter and rebuild a new one. And he wanted his tomb to be a giant monument right next to the tomb of Peter inside the Basilica of St. Peter. For that purpose, he asked Michelangelo to come to Rome and to make the statues for that tomb. 40 statues he ordered. Michelangelo made the first seven, then he ran out of money. He got just a small deposit to start. And he wanted, you know, more money. And the Pope ran short of money because the Basilica was uh, having a stellar cost. At the same time, he was at war against the French because, of course, we always been at war with the French in the Renaissance. And um, my friend Bertrand knows it well. And uh, and uh, they, the contemporaries said that Julius II had, was more familiar with the sword than with the sprinkler. So basically, that was what happened. And you can see the beautiful statues on the Mo of the Moses here on the right. So this was. Uh, around 1505, 1506. Michelangelo went then back to Florence. It was only in 1508 that the Pope was able to convince Michelangelo to come back and work for him. Of course, Michelangelo, by leaving Rome without permission, had made a crime. So he could have had, the, the, the Pope could have had Michelangelo even executed if he wanted, because the Pope was not just a king, was also the representative of God on earth. So any offense to the Pope, you if the Pope employed you, you could not leave. You had to have the permission, which he didn't have, and he went back to. Anyway, he came back, and there is this famous movie, uh, The Torment and the Ecstasy, is based on a novel. Uh, this was made in the 1950s with um, Charlton Heston as Michelangelo. And I just play a few seconds. This is when the Pope again summons Michelangelo and Michelangelo, and then he asks to Michelangelo, I want you to paint the ceiling of a Sistine Chapel. I cannot pay you for the tomb, but I've changed my mind. I think it's bad luck if you build your own tomb while you're still living. You should just leave it after you're dead to your family or the other your succeeders to take care of it. And this is the expression and the reaction that I think, knowing the life of Michelangelo, the type of man he was, 
I think Charlton Heston really nailed the the face and the expression. Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is enormous. I would never do it by myself. I mean, I could, it's possibly. And in fact, it took him four four whole years to paint the old ceiling, which is, of course, as I said, 120 feet long and some 40 feet wide. So this, um, this ceiling was the one I was painted by an artist called Pier Matteo D'Amelia. And of course, Michelangelo said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, sorry, this is the wrong one. I'm not uh, a painter. I'm a sculptor, although he was trained into painting because he stayed, spent um, nearly a couple of years in the workshop of Ghirlandaio. Anyway, the fresco, the fresco technique, it's quite different than a normal painting because you are also to prepare the wall. So you paint on the wet layer plaster. So there is the wall, there is a thick level called a riccio, and then there's the little tonacino, which is basically a fine uh, plaster, which is super fine. And then on that, on the wet one, you paint, creating like a half, a, um, half centimeters thick level of color. So the reason why the fresco lasts so long and it keeps its brightness is because it's not just a, something painted on a surface that you can just scrape off. And once it, it, it falls, it, it, it's, it's done. It falls, it's done. It's something thick. So even if you scratch the wall, the color is still there because it's beneath. And, but to do this, you have, you need to have a team arrange someone who can make the plaster and while it's still wet someone who prepares the colors because the colors didn't come ready made in the 1500s you have to make your own colors by grinding different um, minerals and and make and mixing them with the basically egg whites so it was very difficult to make the egg tempera something that needed a lot of preparation so you need the pupils so Michelangelo also had to work with a number of people and usually they would have a scaffolding like this. But because the chapel is so high, some 20 meters high, they didn't have the money at the time to make some huge scaffolding. So the original scaffolding was built by Donato Bramante with some ropes anchored on the beams on the ceiling, uh, but that didn't really work. So what they did, it was to use, I'm sorry, so this is basically the ceiling, was to use a scaffolding that was designed by Michelangelo using the buche pontaie, uh, which are basically the construction holes. Now, you, if you've been to Italy or to Europe, you might have seen, especially 13, 14, 1500 buildings, they have regular holes on the walls, especially tall brick walls and buildings. They have these regular holes, uh, squared holes in them, which usually are home to pigeons. Now, most, I've heard also some colleagues saying that they were for pigeons. Most tourists think that they were for the pigeons. So always think, oh, how kind are the Italians to have all these pigeon houses in their cities? But, and the pigeons might think so as well, but they were not built for the pigeons. They were basically the scaffolding holes. When you build a wall back then, you had to save as much material as you could. So as they were building the, the wall, they put some beams horizontally into those holes. So they didn't need all the support of the scaffolding from the floor all the way up, especially when building middle aged towers. They can just have a staircase and then just the beams through and some planks on top and that would have done. And this is how Michelangelo built this scaffolding. There was just this, uh, some staircase going up and then there were these beams on the holes that were left next to the windows where the building was, was done. And it just went on the way from the way to another being suspended with nothing underneath. So they didn't need much material to get up there not as much wood and beans, and especially the time to build such a, a tall scaffolding. And of course, the, the scaffolding and also his problems and it is avatage that you could fall. And basically, Michelangelo had to paint uh, standing or curled up. There's a common belief that he painted laying on his back, especially on this part here on the sides, but the I think it's very interesting, the book uh, of, by Colalucci, this one, because Colalucci, he restored, so he basically cleaned the old ceiling. 
And he had tried to do it standing with his back, uh, having his back on the floor. And he says, it's definitely not possible to paint with your back on the floor. You cannot do that, not with or that level of skill or that level of detail, because you can't move. And so he must have done it always standing. In fact, there is also a letter where the Michelangelo wrote with the sonnet to himself. This is the original written by Michelangelo, who had a beautiful calligraphy, where you have also a little sketch on the right, which is representing himself painting. Uh, and he described the fact that he spent there hours and hours with the colors dripping on his face doing this job that was taking a token physically on him for the Pope that wasn't even that appreciative of his, his work. So this is actually uh, Michelangelo's handwriting, a, a beautiful handwriting and his, and his verses. Now, the um, ceiling has basically the, um, here we are, the, um, nine squares in the center where there are the episode of the creation so the god separating dark and light god's creating the planets god creating adam here which is a very famous one and then on the side um prophets and seabills the prophets of course were the jewish prophets the seabills were the were the uh, pagan greek and roman prophetesses so they were basically symbolizing the pagan culture and heritage now with this app we can actually go on the walkway here between the windows which till the 19th century was open to the public tourists used to go up there now not anymore not even special guests only the i think the people who changed the lights which are now made of lead so they probably won't need changing for another 20 years um and so you back then you could go high up to 15 meters so basically almost to the ceiling and see the fresco from a closest distance as we could see and there are also these beautiful figures of men on the sides this is mostly because michelangelo wanted to create a decoration that was also a homage to the masterpiece piece of human of the of, of, of the of the creation which is basically the human the human being of course there's god represented as a normal man with a long beard in this kind of a pink outfit and michelangelo even managed to paint god's bottom something of which he probably was you know was not as supposed to but he did and he showed here there's a lot of um, of course the thousands and thousands of pages have been written to the interpretation of many, many elements of the chapel anyway there is this idea to create a more a figure of god that is not the traditional uh, absolute separate image of vision arriving but someone who has basically um physically created the word in, in giving it more reality more body more roundness something that has never been done before especially showing god's bottom that way and then the creation of adam which is an absolute masterpiece in which you could see that there is a complete new way of representing it now in the bible it says that uh, god created this clay statue and then breath uh, and then um, blow through the nostrils of Adam, giving him in in life. But in this case, you could see a symbolic uh, idea of the creation, where you have the two fingers approaching but not touching. There's about an, an inch gap there, and you could see that uh, for Michelangelo, the greatest gift that God gave to us is not just the fact that we are alive, but it's the fact that we are an image of God in the sense that we are creators. Now, Michelangelo grew up in the house of Lorenzo Magnifico where they were having every day they were having conversation about plato philosophy about the the vision uh, uh, that um, was generated at that time to uh, interpret the 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 bible and the, and the christian history in the view of the greek philosophers and so in that sense the idea that god created the word is not because god needed it god created the word to enjoy himself in the creation as the artists don't do art because they need it but they do art because they enjoy themselves in doing that. There's kind of a, we don't really need art to live, but it's art that makes our life um, a, a way that makes ourselves being able to recognize ourselves in the, in the art and to enjoy ourselves in, in uh, through art. And this is precisely the element that Michelangelo find divine into doing art. And, um, the figure of Adam, as you can see, uh, so beautifully displayed on the side, is just laying on this very basic background. The backgrounds are always like backgrounds that three years old could do, like just a green line or a blue line. There's no flowers, no decoration, no nothing. And he 
put a lot of study into the body, into the torso, and especially after seeing the Belvedere torso in the Vatican, which is the beautiful statue, which is in the Vatican, he was very impressed by that. Also the, um, the Lacoon, which is another statue, which was actually unearthed while Michelangelo was in Rome in, at the beginning of the 1500s, taught the Renaissance artist how to represent movement in a still figure, both in sculpture, but also in painting, as in this case. And about um, 20 or 30 years ago, an American uh, physicist, like while he was just, you know, studying or, or reading something, noticed that the figure of, of God surrounded by angels actually matches perfectly the cross-section of a human brain. Now, we know that Michelangelo made this section of corpses, which was not illegal at that time, was very frowned upon, was something very difficult. And this, uh, since the Middle Ages, where during the Crusades, when a crusader died in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem, in Syria, whenever, they wanted to bring him home. But of course, you couldn't take a corpse, you know, in a journey that lasted months in the heat and all that. So what they did, they boiled those bodies and they took the bones back home, leaving everything else. Um, so that was considered desecration. So was there was a, a, a popal uh, decree uh, banning the, the practice of, of modifying bodies or messing with the bodies. But medical studies were allowed, although you had to find a volunteer a corpse, which is usually corpses of people which, which had died in the countryside or died with nobody claiming the body. So it wasn't very all criminals. It was very difficult that a, a free man would have would have given his body for, for that because they thought that there was something wrong then in the afterlife they mess with your body. Um, I'm not sure if Michelangelo really meant this. It's, uh, it's striking the, the similarity of the brain with the section, but not many people knew how a brain was from the inside back then. Very few had made this section. There were not yet even published studies on anatomy. The first one, I think, is mid-1500s or so. So um, I think it's a very, very interesting idea. I'm not sure it's accurate. And this is the create. This is um, the temptation. So then there's the creation of Eve while Adam was asleep. And it's the end of the... With the creation of Eve is the end of the peace for Adam, as every married man would agree with me. Uh, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but you know, you know what it's like. So peace was over for them, and in fact, they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I'm just kidding. Just uh, um, so you could see Eve here being created by God, and then here they, there is Adam and Eve, very very close, and then here the tree in the middle with the snake, which as well ends up of, as a, in the shape of a woman, because of course. Uh, in the 1500, everything sinful came from women. And you have the fig tree, actually. It's, it's, I always like the fact that it's the fig tree is in the center. This picture has the before and after, so you can see the difference before the restoration and after the restoration. Of course, many of the cracks were being filled. There were a lot of damages over the centuries, some bits here and then had fallen off. So there was a lot of work to be done. And then you could see that this instantly become ugly and shy of themselves, while before they were all there very having a good time. For this image and many others, Michelangelo, as I said, uses a model, both early Florentine masters. On the left, there's Masolino da Panicale's um, fresco in the Cappella del Carmine in, in Florence, a masterpiece that Michelangelo studied as a, as a teenager, so he knew it very well. One of the first representation in a church of a naked couple, like of Adam and Eve naked. In the Middle Ages, they did have nudity, but not much in frescoes. It was mostly in books or in, in codes, in, in manuscripts, very in some bus reliefs it's very rare to see a fresco with, with few news like that something that started mostly in florence and in italy in the 1400s and then on the right the the lacoon is the statue that was discovered discovered nearby the Colosseum in the early 1500s that really taught michelangelo how to model a body how to uh, give that kind of vibrant aspect by twisting the body so after seeing this and the bevelet or so michelangelo they never made the straight body anymore always twisting always turning because that stresses the muscles and can and show better the anatomical aspects of the body and make it more dramatic, more expressive, the figure. And you can see also the snakes, which is quite, um, it's quite interesting. And this kind of um, use of the human body was used extensively as a decorative element. There are many, many figures of naked men all hanging around from the ceiling, as I said, as an homage to the creation, as well as the sibyls. Although this is a woman, it has a 
male-like kind of shoulders and arms. The frames of the bodies in Michelangelo are always the same. And uh, there was something that happened while Michelangelo was still painting the ceiling, which took about four years from 1508 to 1512. At some point, Donato Bramante, who was not very close to Michelangelo, he didn't like him very much, he preferred to him Raphael, took Raphael inside the chapel where Michelangelo wasn't there to see and study what Michelangelo was doing. And, Miguel, and Raphael, not long after, made this fresco with seabills right inside a church, which is uh, called, called the Santa Maria della Pace, not far from the not far from the Piazza Navona in Rome. And after Michelangelo saw this, he went bananas. He said, you stole my ideas. You stole my style. Everything good that you have in art, you stole it from me. They were really, really upset because, of course, Michelangelo could see a similarity in the figures, in the positions, in the torso. That's something that, of course, doesn't come from, 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 from Raphael. Raphael was a kind of a copycat, but it was really the one of the greatest and probably the gifted artists of his age. I do a talk at the end of the month about Raphael and his search of beauty. I personally think he was the most gifted artist who ever lived, and I'll explain that why at the end of the month. But they hated each other. Uh, well, Raphael was kind of an easygoing man, but quite friendly, but Michelangelo despised him and really, really hated him. And Above the windows, Michelangelo also painted this. Let's go downstairs now. He also painted this um, ancestors of, 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 of Christ, which are all above the lunette, this little um, kind of half moon shaped uh, topping on the windows. And there are about 40 figures that represent the ancestors of Virgin Mary from King David to Virgin Mary. Is with The Gospel of Matthew starts with all the generations and the lines. So basically it's to prove that Jesus Christ was born as the descendants of David, so a true king of, of Israel. And, um, and they're very beautiful because they are a complete kind of a gallery of images, of faces, of expression. They're really, really beautiful. And... Um, also, there are four more episodes in the corners, um, David and Goliath here, and then the Judith and Olofernes to be hating just because, you know, the Pope could just uh, basically consider them. And on the other side, there is uh, the Gilded Snake, which is this one here, where snakes, poisonous snakes were raining from the sky, so Moses cast his bronze snake in order to uh, for the people to be saved by looking at it. It's another meaning that if you trust and you believe in uh, in God, God will save you. Now, I will be using a picture. Yes, let's open this one here. Um, to illustrate then the ceiling of the chapel. The other one on the left is Esther and Asuero. Esther is the Jewish princess that saved the Jews from a gen genocide in the um, during the Persian uh, domination. So um, she was the wife of the king. The king wanted to exterminate the Jews, and she said, "No, she had to kill me too." So because he was so much in love with her, they were spared, and their enemies were destroyed. It's another. Um, proof that if you have faith in God, God will protect its people. Now, the ceiling was completed by 1512. Michelangelo went then back to Florence. And a few years later, after the Pope had died, a different Pope was elected. His name was Julius um, uh, Clement VII, and his name uh, was Giulio di Giuliano de' Medici. He was Lorenzo's Magnifico's nephew the son of his uh, murdered brother. He had, the, he, and he was a childhood friend with Michelangelo. They grew up together basically in Florence. So he wanted Michelangelo to come back to Rome and to do this magnificent fresco. The idea was to create the last judgment here and the raise of the debts. So because there was the creation already, the popes, uh, Judaism with, uh, with, uh, with Moses, Christianism, the popes, um, the idea was that we had, because the Sistine Chapel represent the whole project of salvations that, that, that God hates for mankind, the last moment would be the moment to do with, with the last judgment. So Michelangelo started to work on the project, but then the Pope died. It was his succeeder, Paul III, the Pope that started the Catholic Reformation, to wanted to continue this project. And then under him, between 1534 and 1541, the fresco was made. It took Michelangelo seven years to do this one because this one had no frame, no divide, dividing uh, space in space. 
in the Sistine Chapel is all divided by this painted architecture, so it's easier to fill. But this one, the bodies basically create the fresco, which is one grand aspect of this. And um, of course, in the center, there is Jesus Christ, as we could see, is not the skinny Jesus that we usually, uh, you know, we, 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 we usually um, basically uh, see. But this looks like a pagan god. It's huge, it's massive, it's muscular, and also is shaved, there's no beard. And uh, Jesus Christ was represented with no beard in the catacombs and in the early um, early representation of Christ. It was only in the 6th, 7th century, the Byzantine art arriving in, in, the, in the West that Jesus Christ was represented like a philosopher with a big beard. And, um, and of course, there's the Virgin Mary next to him. And all around all the souls of the that are waiting for the judgment and down beneath there's the resurrection of the soul. Now, if we go, first of all, before the chapel was made, this is how it looked like. There were the two, as I said before, the, the assumption of Mary and then the Moses saved from the from the. Uh, waters and the adoration and this is perugino's uh, painting which was on the altar they're all gone they all they were all destroyed and this is michelangelo in this case using a normal scaffolding uh he did this one mostly by himself he had a, a man who was a cripple actually preparing the colors who even died before it was completed and then there was another man who eventually became uh the first curator of the chapel in charge of the spolvero. So once a year, he had to get a big brush and brush it all off from the dust. And that was his, his job that he did. And um, you can see that the figure of Christ, it's inspired uh, by the Apollo de Belvedere, which is a statue which was already in the Vatican collection, now it's in the Vatican museums. And you can see that the expression, the, the part of the position, of course, the body made by Michelangelo is a lot more muscly, but the expression of the figure, the face, even the hairstyle are pretty much the same. So Michelangelo thought that only a Greek god could be a, this, a, a good and adequate representation of Jesus Christ as the um, as the judge, and on the left we have the resurrection of the flesh. So basically, people raising the dead, raising from their tombs. I, I use this picture here. This is a bad definition. In the shrouds, you see skeletons. It's quite terrific. And within this, there's a number of contemporaries as well. There's over 100 people that have been recognized, although most uh, scholars do not agree. So for most of these characters, there are two or three different hypotheses. So I'm only just pointing out some, like one here on the left, uh, probably Girolamo Savonarola, the preacher who basically led the revolution against the Medici and he was eventually burned alive in Florence in 1498 in the square uh, of the Piazza della Signoria, um, the main square in Florence where, it is, where is the Palazzo Vecchio. You have the resurrection here so they're going up and waiting to be judged. This detail here you can also see two colored people and in this time when there's a lot of attention to you know diversity I, I, I think it's very interesting that you uh, you know, Michelangelo in the 1500s at the time where basically uh, the West was at war with, with Turkey and, when, and with the Moors, so there was a lot of tension putting them in the in the in the in the in the resurrection. It's, it shows a a broader a, a more a broader mind. And um, among the figures that are waiting for the for the for the um, sorry uh, for the um, for the resurrection here on the right there are also the sinners that are going down to hell and amongst them there's one which is probably the worst sin ever it's the one who despairs of uh, being able to um to overcome the sin in fact is completely scared and is bitten by the snake that symbolizes the sin is the inevitability of sin is the fact that humans we cannot escape sin and um, there are a few other details you could see some of them are quite 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 beautiful and again the um on the top next to the figure of christ there is san bartolome is up here this figure here he has a knife and is holding a flayed man just the skin but the two portraits do not do not match the 
San Bartolome, we know it was flayed um, and uh, to be tortured by as a Christian martyr. But then the skin, it doesn't match. The skin has hair and mustache, he's, he's bald and he's got a long beard. So there's a, there's a lot of interpretation of stories. First of all, it matches the portrait of Michelangelo. So this is Michelangelo on the left and you can see it's him in there. Why Michelangelo put himself as a flayed man in the painting? The Pope wanted him in skin, possibly, but the Medici definitely wanted him in skin for a while. Uh, in 1530s, he had to hide himself from weeks in the in the in the crypt of San Lorenzo to escape from the Alessandro the Medici who wanted him dead because he, he had worked for the uh, Republic against the Medici. Um, the the other one is that the man holding the skin matches the portrait of uh, Pietro Aretino, this man on the left, who was a poet of the church at the time, was the official poet of the Pope, and had criticized Michelangelo because of the nudity. Uh, the paradox is that this poet is also known for making a lot of erotic poetry. Uh, and when I say erotic poetry, is not kind is like pornographic poetry in which there's an accurate description of sexual intercourses in a number of different ways so it's something really hardcore for, for even now if you read it i got a copy of that but uh there's also some etchings that were made by a friend of Raphael illustrating uh, a quite uh, it's a it's a sort of a renaissance kama sutra but it's kind of a gymnic one so it's uh, something to see really but this is for another tour for another maybe audience and uh, the the uh, the angels, so basically the, 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 the idea was that Aretino had Michelangelo, he would have had Michelangelo's skin because, of course, Michelangelo started to have a lot of troubles because many people criticized the excess of nudity in the fresco, which was on the main altar of the Church of the Pope, uh, the Chapel of the Pope, so it wasn't probably uh, accurate, but for the Pope it was okay. There is another idea that personally I prefer, is the fact that Michelangelo is an artist he knew that his soul was pure because he's the soul of a of a creator like god creator so his soul was already with god plus he followed the teachings of uh, uh, a priest called juan de valdez who was a spaniard uh, and there was a movement called the spirituali they were basically um, christians who believed that if you have faith you don't need the church, you don't need teaching, you don't need anything because God talks straight to you through your faith and you know the truth instantly, which can be a bit dangerous way of thinking. But Michelangelo really taught that the church was corrupted at the time and needed reformation and what was um, needed to be reformed and what was uh, true in the faith can only be found within at the bottom of your soul. So this is the message of Michelangelo's put. My soul is already with God. You will judge my skin because I'm a sinner with my body, but my soul is pure. And, um, and there are a number of angels that there are actually Without wings, they are angels that are more like like classical heroes. And is one is not the first one because there's also uh, some Botticelli's. They have angels without wings, but it's kind of a uh, of a kind of a change from representing traditionally these angels with all these flapping wings as like kind of flying heroes with no wings at all. All these angels, they are they're without wings and they bear the symbols of the passion of Christ, the cross, the crown of thorns and the column through which Jesus Christ was martyrdom. And then you can see the sinners here all waiting to be judged, all afraid. They don't know what's going on. They have got their eyes open here. And on the right, you have St. Peter giving back the keys because the, by then the, uh, the mission of the church would be closed. And next to him, St. Paul again, they're there. While on the top right, all this, the, saint, the souls are all celebrating because they're going to heaven. And as we saw before down here, they're going to hell. There is St. Catherine, a number of other marches and saints, and Sebastian with the arrows, and then a group that represent the seven deadly scenes. Now, one here is pulled down by a bag of coin and two keys, so properties and, and money, and that is greed. Then there is a man with the, a first in his mouth, gluttony, and there's a man pulled down, a sinner pulled down by his genitals. Ouch! And that is lost and a few others amongst them and at the very bottom michelangelo is a genius because it doesn't show hell it just shows the entrance of hell the very idea of eternal damnation it's enough to scare everyone to death it doesn't have to show it and he added some elements that he took from this the tale of san sebastian 
some of the sinners here that he took from Dante Alighieri, especially the boatman here, Caron, this green devil on, on the left, beating the sinners. He's the one that ships the uh, souls from to the underworld. And you can see there's a number of creatures, a number of devils there, pulling them, beating them. Amongst them, some of the sinners that were also described by Dante Alighieri in his Divine Comedy. This year, the 70 years anniversary since Dante died. Dante is the father of Italian languages, uh, the very first uh, poet who in, insisted in using the Italian language as also a language for scholarly writings and for poetry at the time where most people were writing in Latin still, in not just in Italy, in Europe. And then at the gates of hell, so this is Caroon, the Green Devil, which is also believed to be the portrait of, I think it was the Prince of Naples or someone from one of the nobles in, in southern Italy. And, uh, and then at the gate of hell, there is Minos, the judge of the souls, the one who tells the souls which part of hell they should go to pay back for their sins. And he has a snake all around his body and donkey ears. This man is the portrait of another contemporary Michelangelo, Biagio da Cesena, who was the secretary, the master of ceremonies of the Pope, basically his secretary, who criticized the fresco in front of Michelangelo. One day before the fresco was completed, the Pope went there to check how it was coming. And he asked to this man, uh, what do you think about that? And then they had basically a uh, kind of an argument in front of the Pope and the Pope said, let Master Michelangelo do it and he's, he knows what he's doing. Anyway, the Pope was supportive of, of Michelangelo. Pope Paul III had four children of himself, so he wasn't really kind, you know, um, he knew what it was like having women and doing stuff. So he wasn't too, um, wasn't problematic with that. He was a very uh, highly educated man. Anyway, during those times, there was the Catholic Reformation to answer the problems that happened to the Catholic Church with Protestantism, Lutheranism, and then after the uh, English Church also uh, split from the Catholic Church, then the, the Concilio di Trento, the, the Catholic Reformation started. In 1563, while well, Michelangelo was still alive, it was 87, but was still living, and it was living in Rome, the, the, the council stated that Every nudity in the church must be covered, including the chapel, the Sistine Chapel, and mentioned the Sistine Chapel and the, the frescoes. So Michelangelo was asked to go back and cover the frescoes. And he said, uh, no way, you know what? I'm 87, nearly 88. And I think that there is a much, the church has much bigger problems than a bit of pain on the wall. Anyone could do that. So one of his pupils called Daniele da Volterra, a very talented and gifted artist, was asked to cover some of them. About 18 were covered then. And then in the following years, um, about the same number were covered. A total of just over 30 of them were covered. Some of them completely repainted, like this one group here. So this is a, is a copy of the chapel made on painting which is kept in Naples in the Museo di Capodimonte, which was painted soon after the fresco was come. You could see that there's no underwear. Most of them, they're like all nude. So apparently for Michelangelo, um, heaven was a sort of nudist place. You see even St. Peter, all the men, all with everything out in the air. And uh, so Daniela Volterra covered them. And then later other artists were asked to complete the job. So as they went towards the end of the century and the 17th century, the idea changed and they wanted more nudes to be covered. So uh, this is a process that happened also for the statues and many other artworks which were covered and censored mostly till the 19th century. So uh, many of them also were made in the 19th century. Anyway, Daniela da Volterra was a great painter but it, his paintings are in the greatest museums in the world, even in the Louvre. And um, and uh, what, what, what happened is that whenever the... Uh, Everybody describes him now. They call him the braguettone, the trouser maker, because his the main his main the main thing what he's known for is that they put the trousers on on Michelangelo's figure. So there's a lesson there to be learned. I think if whatever you do in life, if you're good at what you do, if you don't good, it doesn't matter as much as if you mess with somebody else's work. Especially it's one of the greatest artists of his time. So don't mess with other people's work. Just make sure you do your good work and don't mess with other people's work because that's a lesson. This some figures like. Like St. Catherine, which is this one here, and St. Sebastian, they were actually looking like they were one on top of each other. So these were completely chiseled off and completely repainted, replastered. That's why during the last restoration, some of the veils have been taken off, but most of them has been, uh, they've been left. 
first of all because i think still in the night in the 1980s and still nowadays the pope doesn't really want you to stare at some a bunch of willies hanging from the wall while you are celebrating service and and secondly because the the original one would have been erased or damaged and so probably they would have had to paint a fake one so by then it's just leaving the one that is now historical and anyway this is what there's an official relationship for hundreds of pages when they explain every decision what was taken whether to restore one bit not one other what to do with that and with all the photographic evidence that's what they said in that in that official in that official document and one of the thing i'm asked most times is well there are some of the greatest artworks in the artists in the renaissance work there botticelli perugino ghirlandaio uh, signorelli and so on but why not Raphael, which was there? Well, there was a Raphael in not long ago because the tapestries that Raphael had designed and they were made in Brussels by Peter Malels, which are now kept in the uh, Pinacoteca Vaticana in the Vatican Museums, they were usually hung underneath the frescoes of the Quattrocentisti of the 1400s down here. And at the beginning of last year, in February 2020, for the 500 years anniversary since Raphael died, they hung them again. And the, that was one of the few times in the last year because I'm only I only know that they did that maybe do, um, in 2005 or 2006 shortly for a week or two and then it was another 10 15 years before they did that in 2020 so um, it's really a rare occasion the original cartoons the original drawing for these tapestries by Raphael are again in London in the Victorian Albert Museum um, and the Sistine Chapel is synonymous of the election of the popes although it was only used as the election of the Pope, for the election of the Pope um, in the 1500s for a while, and then mostly in the 20th century. In the 19th century, it was the Palazzo Quirinale. Before, they mostly used the Palazzo of Apostolico, some conclave election of the Popes were done in different places. And you could see that basically they, they created um, um, a number of kind of an assembly space with the seatings, and then the Pope sits on one end, during the ceremonies. And when they do an election of the Pope, this is the, let me just see. Um, they basically put benches and everything so the Pope can see. Um, inside the, so the Pope can be elected, sorry. Uh, inside the chapel, there's also, um, let me just go forward here. So they put all benches around and they do the conclave with the, the Cardinals, which is just over 100 now. They basically vote for the uh, next to be the Pope. And it's a quite a long process. Back in the times, it took like months because everybody had to travel, although most Cardinals already reside in Rome back then. But um, now, of course, it's something that is done within a few days because I believe they have a WhatsApp group. They just go put the next guys and then within a few days, they might find the agreement. Of course, the conclave is a very complex process they have to agree two-thirds of the cardinals must vote for the same uh, person that represent basically the church um there is also a cantoria that's where the singers were standing and they've also restored of course the rest of the chapel and in recent years they found in this cantoria uh, the signature of a master of the choir Josquin de Pre was a French uh, conductor who worked there at the beginning of 1500s. It was actually, by the way, for two years, master of the Sistine Chapel, master of music. And he was Martin Luther's favorite musician. Martin Luther said that Josquin de Pre was the first musician who may, most musicians write music according to the law of the music. Um, Josquin de Pre was the first musician who was able to write music, imposing his own law on music. And it, it's a beautiful Renaissance uh, musician. You can find his music on, on, on YouTube, on, online very, very easily. Now, the, uh, we'll have a question time now. Before that, just let me tell you the last couple of things. When they elect the Pope, they have in the sacristy, now to, if you go to the chapel through this door here, that's where most people enter when you arrive from the museums. The other door leads to a sacristy, which actually is made of five different rooms. The first one has a full three different size of the Popal outfit during the conclave, because of course, if the Cardinals are inspired by God and they know who's gonna be the next Pope, who's the right one to vote with, the tailors are not inspired, so they just prepare three different sized outfits for the Pope to um, to 
put them. So this is just down that little room when there's also the changing room for the priest. And of course, the um, announcement that the Pope has been elected is made using the smoke from the chimney. Now, there isn't a chimney there permanently because they only use it every now and then. In Italian, there's a, an expression, a way of saying, ogni morte de papa, every when to say that something that doesn't happen very often or only every few years we say when does that take place eh, every morte di papa every time the pope dies which is like every 10 or 20 years or so or so 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 on um something that doesn't happen very often so they don't they don't have one permanently but this is a door that usually takes you to the basilica of saint peter usually they have here the fireplaces standing those that i show you in the picture here the law the fire burning and then they use some um artificial coloring to make this black smoke or the white smoke. Back in the times they used the uh, some wet hay, but they don't do it anymore. They just use the chemicals. It's easier. Everything is modernized now, so they use that too. Um, and um, now, I hope you enjoyed this virtual tour. If you appreciate this tour, please consider um, uh, fill up our questionnaire. Uh, now, support Giovanni will put the link to the questionnaire on the website both on Facebook and on the chat. And we will also send that you, to you via mail. Uh, please consider writing a five-star review. You can also book one of our upcoming tours using a discount code that will also be sent via email called Sistin 2021, pretty easy to remember. When you book online, there's a blue spot where you can put insert voucher or discount code. This one gives you 20% discount on all our tours for the next 24 hours. So this expires in one day, or you can buy a gift card. You will also be receiving a link if you would like to make a donation or do a tip. What's next? So the next free tour will be February 14th for St. Valentine. So I thought something romantic. It will be later, it will be at 11 p.m. Rome time, so it will be a night time, it's Sunday night, it will be the 5 p.m. in the East Coast in the US, it will be 10 p.m. in the UK, um, and it will be like the afternoon in the other time zones in North America and in South America. Um, and I believe it'd be next morning for Australia and New Zealand, sorry. Um, it's quite difficult to get a time that is good uh, globally. We have, I have people following from Australia, from Asia, from uh, from Europe, from North America, Canada, and, and, and Central and South America. Anyway, um, and it would be about Venice, which is the most romantic place ever. And then the next weekend, uh, this weekend would be, uh, uh, I would do, be doing a virtual tour uh, these are paid tours, the Colosseum and the Life of the Gladiators, where I'll take you to the room inside the Colosseum and we'll be discussing the life and the habits and the death of the gladiators. And then the next day, Pompeii, I'll be using also 3D reconstructions of Pompeii as it was, a 3D reconstruction of the eruption, and also a surprise with drone images and some wonderful music. And then the next weekend, we'll speak about Raphael, the master of sublime beauty. And I will be reconnecting us, of course, with Michelangelo, with the things we sent today. And then uh, starting from January the 30th, and for five Sundays, I'll be uh, speaking about um, Venice. And each, Sunday, and each Saturday, sorry, there'll be a talk about a different aspect of um, Venice. So Vivaldi, Palladio, Titian, Tintoretto, one great artist that worked or lived mainly in Venice, starting with Vivaldi. His life and his music, I'll also be playing some music by Vivaldi that you might not heard of. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have questions now, I will allow everyone to unmute themselves if you want to. And if you want to say something, if you want to ask more questions, of course, sorry, I went a little bit uh, did the presentation a little bit longer than I thought, but there's so much to say in such a, a short, a short, a short time. If you want to go and see again these 3D um, modeling, it's available for free on the website of the Vatican Museums, on the official website. There's no commentary, but you can uh, free to navigate and see the details and climb on the walls, on the windows. Now, Joanne, if there are questions, if people want to ask questions, please... Um, Okay, please uh, pass me the questions and we'll take them. Or if you want to uh, open the microphone and ask any question or say hello, you're welcome to do uh, so. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully the system chat will be open soon. So uh, 
it won't be busy for a while, which is not not necessarily a bad thing. Till last year, uh, till 2018, there were to 2019, there were six million visitors in the Vatican Museum every year, some 30,000 a day, a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, let me see if the Yes, so there's Alessandra. Hello, I didn't understand what the rooms between the roof and the ceiling of Sistine Chapel did anyone. Leave? Yes, so in the 1500s, they were the barracks of the Swiss guards. So the Guardia Svizzera, they lived there. They have their quarters, their barracks. Um, it's not a bad place. I mean, they got a penthouse there. The under the roof was hot in the summer and cold in the winter. So it was an idea. That's why the troops were there and not like a cardinal someone. But imagine that till the 1980s, when they did the conclave, the election, the cardinals, there wasn't the, Hazo, the Casa Santa Marta, the building which is now where the Pope lives. It's looking at the basilicas on the left. It's a modern building was built again by John Paul II during the 80s or the 90s. And they had to basically squat in the Palazzo Apostolico in one corridor. They put curtains up. So all these cardinals had to live in these little quarters. And to go to the toilet, they had to cross some 20 other bedrooms. <laughs> so it was really like camping inside the Palazzo Apostolico. It was really uncomfortable. <laughs> so, and, and so it was, that was a big thing. Yeah, they built this building where now the employees live. But during the conclave, they had to clear out and leave the rooms for the cardinals. And they are basically small two bedroom apartments. That, that's in one of those, they're about 80 square meters. In one of those, that's where the Pope uh, Francis lives now, which um, uh, he, everybody loves him. And he's got this kind of uh, more socialist views, we would say, which in, in Italy and Europe, socialist doesn't mean terrorist like in the US. It's, uh, it's it's more like it's, it's got more like it's a, it's a it's a common person who wants to live like a common person. So no fancy shoes, no fancy outfits. Uh, he lives like in a two bedroom. He doesn't use the big penthouse. And two or three years ago, the Cardinal Bertone spent three hundred thousand euros refurbishing his flat, flat, his penthouse. The Pope went bananas <laughs> because he spent so much money. Like like he has like a jacuzzi or that kind of stuff. I say, we don't do this. Okay, any more? What's your interpretation of the two horn-like things? So the horn, um, now in the translation of the Bible from the Vulgata, from Hebrew into Latin, that was made by um, St. Jerome, the, the interpretation of the horns uh, when Moses came down from the from the Mount Sinai, he had rays of light from his head. And in Latin, it's translated as he had horns because of the translation wasn't done properly. So in the Middle Ages, very often the, um, the Moses is horns. And that Michelangelo kept that kind of image of horn. Um, some people would say that that's also the original height of the block of marble, but I think that artistically that's quite irrelevant. Um, it's a very soft, uh, it's a statue that Michelangelo worked a lot, and then Moses he even turned it at some point. In fact, there's a random leg at the back. Um, it's very interesting if you read the biography. Uh, Michelangelo by um, Antonio Forcellino, who is a restorer that also made many restorations in Rome. He's, he's got quite a, an insight on that. Um, so I understood the Sistine Chapel was built designed by military architect. Yes. Um, ever used for military purposes? No. <laughs> when did the Kingdom of Italy, which the Pope uh, was a king, change to become the Vatican City? So the the chapel was built in that way because it was the architect's uh, design. It was never used for military purposes, although the Vatican City had walls and it was had a lot of mil military um, features. The, the um, Kingdom of Italy was unified. The first part, which was not including the Vatican and the region of Rome, was in 1860. March 1861, the um, the unification, the Kingdom of Italy was declared, which included most of continental Italy, Sicily, uh, Sardinia, but not Rome and Latium, and not Venice and the Northeast. Um, in 1866, Venice became part of Italy, and later on, uh, the 20th September 1820, the Italian Bersaglieri, uh, running uh, uh, infantry troops, 
uh, made a hole in the room, in the walls of Rome, and got into the into the Vatican. The Vatican City became uh, an independent state then, but it wasn't recognized as an independent state until 1929, when Mussolini made the treaty. And I'll explain all this. There's a tour about the secrets of the Vatican in um, that will be uh, doing uh, February the 7th where we'll see the parts of the Vatican City and the Vatican Museum, which are not normally, normally open to the public. So the Pauline Chapel, which is the other chapel that Raphael, that, sorry, that Michelangelo painted after the Sistine Chapel, is another chapel painted by, by Michelangelo in the Vatican. And then the uh, part of the library, the, the, the secret archive, and we'll talk about all the aspects, less and known aspects of the Vatican City, how the state works. And so basically, it was 1870 when Rome became the capital city of Italy again. So Leonardo arrived in Rome uh, uh, in 1513. So the ceiling was already done and there was no idea, no need to paint the main altar wall. He was there because the Pope was Leo X, which was Lorenzo Magnifico's son. And it, it, it was very close to, of course, uh, to, the, to the Florentine artists. But the experience that Leonardo had in Rome wasn't great. He was hosted in a narrow room by the Belvedere, where now it's part of the Pius Clementine Museum, where there is the staircase now. And um, he had people, he believed that were people spying on him. And basically, he had uh, he had uh, um, he had he decided to leave then and go to France, uh, where he was hosted by the King of France, Francois the um, First. So um, it 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 didn't. He did um, what he did for the Pope was basically uh, work as a cartographer. He did mapping of the area southern of Rome and the coast. Uh, there was a marshland, marshy area, so the Pope wanted those marshes to be drained. And, there, and and so um, Leonardo did some service there. He worked more, more in that case. And then he was doing experiments on corpses. And the Pope received a letter where they say that Leonardo was a necromancer. Of course, the Pope didn't believe that because it was the Pope. It wasn't like, a, you know, it was a prime man. But he, he told Miguel and Leonardo to stop uh, dissecting body in the Vatican because, you know, they didn't want people to speak about that. Um, thank you very much. Well, Michelangelo, Philo, and There is uh, one way, one, once that Michelangelo was, um, was asked if, the, if we liked uh, those bodies, those men, he said, yeah, yeah I, lo I like them very much. The reason for which he loved those kind of muscular bodies is because he find them expressive of what he saw, the contrast between the aspiration of the soul to purity and God, and the um, the basically the drive of the feelings and the passions and the scenes. Now, in one of Plato's work, the Phaedon, the soul is described as being eternal in the presence of God, then falling in onto the earth in a body. And the body is called frura in Greek, which means prison. So the body is actually a prison of the soul and the soul tends to go back to, to God, to where it belongs, through love and through art, through beauty, through inspiration. So the contrast between the inside part of the body, the soul, and the outside is represented by Michelangelo in this huge muscle, heavy body that are like a burden, that is very muscular. Plus, he also aesthetically liked those shapes, the effect that they had, because that's why I showed the the, the big muscle, lacoon, the muscle statue. So there is, of course, a preference of what he, he, he was looking at, but also the idea that they really expressed his idea of the contrast between the matter and the soul in a platonic way, because um, in the in the 1400s, the Medici established the Platonic Academy in the Villa di Gareggi. They had basically these conversations about Plato's, about the philosophy. So that that this was the vision of the world at that time. That's what they believed in, which was the kind of new way of, of philosophy. Um, okay, we have any more questions? I hope everything was good. Um, Jonathan, how was the theology? Was it good? <laughs> It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. As always. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. You're okay. I'm fine. Thank you. I've been dying to do one of these, but the schedule has never worked. Today it worked. <laughs> so thank you. Thank I'll, you I'll be back for sure.
Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. So I appreciate if you do the, especially the feedback. There's the link here on the, on the feedback. If you give us a feedback, no feedback to use. Okay. This is the Giovanni spamming. Thank you very much. The link to the recording will be available for the next few days. So we'll send you the link. It'll be on YouTube and all the other platforms. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Take care. Uh, stay safe. And hopefully we'll keep traveling again sooner than later. <laughs> Bye, buonanotte, thank you very much.